Hi everyone! Happy Saturday, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Chit Chat with DC. And I am live from East Texas. I'm so excited you guys are joining me today. For everybody in the U.S., happy Memorial Weekend. I'm hoping you guys are enjoying this. We finally have some sunshine in East Texas, so let's do this. For those of you guys who don't know me, I am your host. I am also an author. I'm a podcaster. Above all, I am truly a dreamer. And I started this series because I wanted to help. And I wanted to empower creative individuals who were kind of stuck in their career to transition to more powerful, more passionate ones. This is the reason we're here. Today, I have absolutely the honor to have an awesome guest, Miss Mary Warmington, who is the Executive Director for Habitat for Humanities. You are going to love her. It is how do we live our lives? How do we find a fulfilling, passionate lifestyle? doing something a little different, like nonprofit work. So Ms. Mary's gonna be here. Before she joins us, kinda let me give you some quick notes. If you're watching this, go ahead, give this episode a like, share with somebody, invite them to join us. You know we're always better when we're doing this together. If you're watching us on YouTube, join the program, subscribe, make sure you hit that notification so you can get all this fabulous content. Make sure you're joining us. I'm hoping you guys are ready for this incredible program. So before, let's jump in and let's get started. So let me bring on Miss Mary. Hi, Madam. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. And so thankful that you asked me to be here. It's truly an honor. I am so happy you're here and I kind of tell, you know, we chit chatted before we started. It was like, it was meant to be because we color coordinated. I don't know how that <laughs> happened. <laughs> I didn't ask, but God put it all together. So That's Ms. right. Mary, That's right. Ms. Mary, let's start with a little bit about you. You are okay. the executive director. You are the director for Habitats for Humanities, a nonprofit. And I just want to start with, tell us a little bit about it. Because most people I know are not familiar with the organization. What do you guys do? What is going on? Come on, tell us. That's true. Jimmy Carter, back in his presidency, after he got out, he really brought Habitat for Humanity to light in the United States. Habitat is an international organization and it started when two people went on a mission trip and they were in a foreign country and the living situations were terrible and they saw where people were living in lean-tos made out of grass and timber and cardboard, anything that they could find. And I'm going to turn my, this off, sorry. <laughs> Hey, we're live. Um, it happens. It's all good. <laughs> and what happened was they looked around and said, you know, we need to build this particular family something more stable. And they built just a cement block home. But what she found was that all these people from the village came over and, and started to help. And so here was this less than 400 square foot home that they had built just because they saw a need. So they come back to the States in South Georgia and got to thinking about driving down the streets where they could see it in the country where people were living in shacks. And they decided that maybe they could start the same thing here. If people could come together and build a home for someone else, they could do it. And they did. That's how inner Habitat International started. And the very first home that was built was actually in San Antonio, Texas. To this day, I have no idea why, but that's where that affiliate started. And that's where people came together. Well, when President Carter came out of office and decided he was going to start helping Habitat, all of a sudden, all of these affiliates started popping out all over the country, including Texarkana. So we have been here since 1987. Wow. I always say that it was the best kept nonprofit under the radar because no one really knew a whole lot about it. Coming from a nonprofit background, I knew about it 10 years ago because I was with another nonprofit with United Way and we had this day of caring and I called out to Habitat and said, hey, if y'all are doing anything and you need some volunteers to come out, we can help you. And at the time, Habitat was totally volunteer based. And someone said, yes, we're building a house. 
So we send a whole crew out to the house that they were building. And out of that, a couple of volunteers decided to stay with the organization. And that was the last. So I knew there was one in Texarkana. It was just not very active because it was volunteer driven. And when people have a eight to five job, you have Saturday work, you know? So that's how I knew about it. But in Texarkana, there have been 14 rehabs and brand new homes built um, up until three years ago. And then three years ago, I came on and they said, I asked, I said, what do you want me to do first? And they said, find us quality applicants and let's build some houses. So we have quality applicants and we have built five houses, sold all those five. And then we had two that were kind of rehabs that we sold those as well. And now we have another one we're getting ready to rehab and sell again and put a family that needs it in there. And for all the people, they always think that Habitat gives away homes. We do not give them away. I was going to ask you that because there's such a confusion behind what does Habitat do? How do they do it? Everybody says, okay, they're going to build houses, but am I just going to get a house? You know, that, I think that's the huge misconception people would have. Like, A, what's a, what is a good applicant, number one? How do you build this? Let's start with that. Let's start with some basics for people who are not sure. What does that mean? Am I an applicant? How do I qualify to be an applicant? <laughs> an applicant is someone that is in the median income range of our area. And you'd be surprised at the median income in the area. There's not, it's not a lot of, not a lot of money. So to qualify for us, a single person needs to make at least $18,000 a year. <laughs> there was something flying. <laughs> or um, the maximum of $23,000 a year. And you think, how can someone live without much money? Well, they can, or that little money. They can, and they do. And then as the scale goes up, obviously a family of four needs to earn a little more than that. And if they qualify, in that particular thing, then they come in and do a, an application. And we find out, you know, how long have you been at your work? Do you pay your bills? Do you have a lot of debt? And you would be surprised at how many people think that, oh, I don't have any debt because um, a lot of my people wrote that off. Well. No, you still owe that debt. I'll give you a perfect example. We had someone that I thought was going to be the perfect applicant. We ran a credit history, not a credit report. I don't care if you have 700 or 200, but if you pay your bills, because there are some people out there that have money that pay all their bills, but they don't have a credit score because they don't have a credit card. They are totally okay. out of debt. Yes. That's so awesome. that is the whole yes. awesome. I was like, oh wow. Oh yeah, I could go into the whole rant about that. But um, people that just have a good credit history. Okay. Well, they're the perfect applicant. This particular person said it looked good on paper. We ran the credit history. I had a call and say, I'm sorry, you do not qualify because you have this history, this debt. What was it? Well, four different telephone providers. And the response was, well, they wrote that off. Like, no. Yeah. They may have written it off, but you still owe it. And it's the integrity issue. You have to pay your debts. And so it eliminated them from the whole housing project program because they did not want to take care of their bills. So, so someone, yeah, so, so someone that has pays their bills, they have good work history that fall into that median income range that can go into a financial institution and say, I found a house, I want to buy it. They're not going to get that lending. So Habitat, all they need is a hand up. And that's what Habitat's motto is, a hand up, not a handout. 
because they'll come, they'll have to volunteer 100 hours for a nonprofit or a charter or a school somewhere in our community, 100 hours before we ever break ground. Then once we break ground, they have to put in 100 hours to build their own home. Okay, Miss Mary, before we go on, why do they have to do the 100 hours prior to? Because I didn't know about that, and I think that's so interesting. What is it about that 100 hours? Besides making you commit to something, why? Yes, well, one, making a commitment. And it shows that they really have the heart for giving back to what's going to be given to them. Mm. And if they can go out and volunteer 100 hours to something, it just shows that they're going to be committed to working towards building their home. So, and it's kind of like um, someone interviewing someone for a co- for a job. The first thing they look at is, oh, they went through four years of college. That means that they stayed, made a commitment, and did it. Same difference. Okay. I don't know why I say same difference. Same thing. Same thing. <laughs> I like the fact that they also have to work towards. And I read somewhere that yeah. it said nobody goes and works unless the person who is getting the house is there. Is that true? That's right. That's right. So if that person says, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to commit to working on, on my house. And we have a we could have 30 people show up to build the home. And if that homeowner decides, oh, no, I'm too tired. It's Saturday. I've worked all week. Okay, then we're going to stop your house. And if this continues, then you're eliminated from the process anyway. Oh, yeah. I like the commitment. I also like the fact that they have a stake. This is real. Somebody didn't give them something. Because I think when, when some things are given to you, it doesn't have the same effect as I work for this. Like, this is mine. This is something I committed. This That's is something right. that has so much passion. Tell us about the, you have five houses in the last three years, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. Tell Mm -hmm. us about those homeowners. What has been that reaction? Because if you're thinking about it, your limit 18 to 23,000 doesn't sound like a lot. But if you're living in that space and you said, I need a home for my family, what does that feel to be a first time homeowner and build your own home? That's right. You build your own home, but also you purchase that home at the end of that build. Yeah. Oh, that's, awesome. that's the piece that everyone doesn't understand because everyone thinks, oh, I'm getting a new home. No, you're not getting a home. You're buying a new home. So in that whole process, they have to have to save enough money to pay for closing costs. And, you know, every house has to have insurance and every home is going to have to pay taxes. So we give them enough time to save up that money. So at closing costs, they can write that check and sign those papers just like everybody else you go to we happen to have an attorney that does it does it for us because he loves habitat and so he prepares all the paperwork and everything so we go to his office and we sign those papers and we hand over that payment book because we are the mortgagee habitat yes so okay yeah. So when we build a house and we spend sixty thousand dollars on this home, but we're selling it to them at fair market value, it still takes us twenty five years to regain our money. So our investment is in that house, and they make their monthly payments. Twenty five years later, ooh, we paid the house off. <laughs> so. The benefit, too, is that they are getting a mortgage that is 0% interest. Okay, hold on. Zero? Zero. Really? Okay. Yeah. So my yeah. heart just went like, oh, my God, that is absolutely <laughs> amazing. Because think about it. You're looking at families who are trying to get to that next level. You're trying to look at how do I get my family to be out of an apartment or have our own space, something that my children can have. But if you're paying three, four, or five, whatever that percentage is, you, you, you said it yourself, they're not going to qualify for a regular mortgage. They're not going to get an institution to back them because they don't have the credit scores. But zero percentage, you literally are paying just straight principal. There is no actual interest rate. How does Habitat actually pull that off? That's right. 
just the history. And it started off, you know, very small. You have one homeowner, they pay their principal every every month. And so that goes right back in, into our building fund. And so we've been here since 1987. So we had money saved away. And so we were able to build five houses, you know, but now we've gotten to where, okay, what do we do now? Because if we continue at this rate of building, we're going to run out of money. So that's why, you know, nonprofits, not just us, but all nonprofits have fundraisers and you try to keep building that fund back up to do the mission that we're supposed to do. You recently opened the Habitat for Humana store here in town, which I have been celebrating. I'm like, yes, go Miss Mary. Like, have you been there? I've not made it. I finally, like, we had a whole discussion in a roadway meeting. Where are you at? How do we find you? We need to get there. Tell us about it. What is that new mission you guys embark? Because it is so much passion every time I talk to us. What, what are you doing? Yeah, this is a proven model. Okay. Habitat, Habitat affiliates in communities come came to the same thing that we did is, whoa, we are building, we're putting families and homes, it's fantastic, but we're going to run out of money. What is our next step? Well, I knew the next step three years ago because we knew all Habitats that have a restore generate enough money to not just keep the rent of the building or purchase of the building, whichever one they're going to do, pay for their staff to run it and generate enough money to build houses. So wow. that is ultimately our goal is to have the store. And we found these great landlords that did probably about $50,000 worth of upgrades to the building just so we could be there. That is yeah. so awesome. I know. Community men, community families that know the mission of Habitat and wanted to just keep going. And so we have a really nice entrance. We have a wheelchair ramp. We have new lighting. It's a great building. And they customized it for us. So we have people in our community that donate to us, donate. They're moving. So they have all this um, building supplies, they have furniture, they have stuff in their garage that they're going, we don't wanna take this with us. So they call us, we go and pick it up and we put it in our store, we clean it up. We, a lot of it is just gently used stuff or some things that have just been there and they're just outdated. And, but there's a treasure for everyone. And you heard that added there. <laughs> one man's treasure, one man's trash is another man's treasure. That's what we are. And it's kind of an eclectic thing. Think of a home improvement store. Okay. That's what you're going to find at the restore. Ooh. And the two bo big box stores, they're our friends. They support us. Home Depot, that is 1.2 miles from us and Lowe's that is 1.7 miles from us. And of course, the big Walmart store that is just a half a mile down the road. All of them are supporters. If they have something that, okay, they cannot sell anymore, the manufacturer has said, get rid of it. Instead of it going into the trash compactor and getting into the landfill, it's coming to the restore. Okay. Can we just point out how amazing that is? Because I think a lot of times we think of corporate organizations as, you know, just there to take our money. But when they're invested in the community and they're giving back to organizations like you, you're going, oh, my God, that actually happened. That is actually that you can say that is incredible how that connection, that synergy came together. And just all these little pieces, by the way, anybody yeah. who's in Texarkana or near Habitat for Humanity needs to check it out because prices are very reasonable. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We have new things and gently used things that at retail value, they start off at 60% off. Nice. And then if we kept one item for, let's say, an extra 30 days, it's going to go down even more. So we're hoping that doesn't happen. We're hoping that it sells right off the bat. I'm crossing my fingers and sending you some prayers. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, Ms. Mary, you have been in this nonprofit world for a while. 
what attracted you to it? Because a lot of our listeners and viewers are going to be like, you know, my dream is to make millions, millions of dollars or do A, B, and C, but nobody sees success connected to a nonprofit. How did you get started and why did you stay in it? <laughs> a couple of years ago, I did go back into the corporate world. I just wanted to make sure that I could do it. Okay. And I did. And it was very profitable for me personally. But I found myself coming back to Texarkana. It seemed like every other weekend. And I finally decided that I needed to do something a little bit different. So my transition back into Texarkana was to end up at the jewelry store. And there are good friends over at Crocker's. And one day I had this, uh, who is now my board chair, walk in and she said, how, what are you doing here? And I said, I just need to be back in Texarkana. And she said, well, why are you here? I said, oh. <laughs> and she said, she said, come visit our Habitat board. We'd love to have you as, because you have such a background of nonprofit. So I was here for a couple months, helped with a fundraiser. And the next thing I know at a board meeting, he's gone now, but um, gosh, it's been three years now. He locked the door after everyone was leaving. And I said, what are you doing? He said, here. And he handed me this, this paper and it said executive director job description. And I said, do you want me to help be on a committee and help find a person? And he said, no, we want you to take it. I'm like, uh, I'm not sure about this. <laughs> because we had never had a director. It was totally volunteer driven. Oh, wow. And so I thought about it and I thought, yeah, this is where I need to be. And so, yeah, April was three years that I've been here. And that's how I got back into nonprofit. Originally, I was working with the largest retailer in the world. And I was working on the foundation side where I could give away money. Okay. I worked for the Walton Foundation. I was based out at Sam's Club. And that's how originally I came to Texarkana through Walmart. And I worked out of Sam's Club and I gave money away. So I started meeting all these nonprofit directors. And we're talking 22 years ago. And I would call them up and say, I have some money or I have this grant application and, or we have this merchandise. Do you want it? And so I was everybody's friend in the nonprofit world. <laughs> we need people like that. Trust me. Those are very needed. <laughs> we do. I still look for them. And so what happened was um, United Way asked me to be on their board. I was sure. And it was great. I was on certain committees. I worked on the campaign, which I really enjoyed. It was just a really fun time working on the board. When our director was leaving, I had, and it's probably before your time, but Dr. Hensley, that was the president of A&M at the time, uh, asked me to be on a search committee to find a director. And so I... I was serving and we were interviewing people and everything. And one afternoon we were walking across the street and I had one of my co board members say, you should apply for this job. And I said, seriously, I know what it's paying. I would leave my 401 and my profit sharing. Are you serious? And he said, just think about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I just kind of let it go. Well, that was during the weekend and we were on a working on a project and the more i thought about it i thought you know i i bet that this would really be more fulfilling than what i'm even what i'm doing so i took a leap of faith and i really do think it was just a god thing because i found where i needed to be and every day, even with, you know, less money, no, no parts, nothing, it 
it felt good at the end of the day doing something, you know, doing something for the community that we may not see the benefit of it today, but we will see it tomorrow and maybe even later. And I always knew that when I'd be walking through the grocery store or I'd be pumping gas and somebody would say, Miss Mary, and I'd turn around, hi, and I'm flipping through my cards in my brain and I know exactly who they were. And they said, oh, I had such a fun time working on that project or I'm so glad that you worked on that project. And do you know that person is my cousin? And it was just amazing. And today I still have that. I'll have somebody say, do you remember me? I'll look at them and they'll pull down their mask and go, oh, yes, I remember <laughs> It's, it's just that little knowledge that we made a difference in somebody's life. And being here is the same thing. And I found my purpose. I, I found where I needed to be. And I may not be living the life that I thought I was going to live, you know, and, you know, having all everything that I ever wanted, but those are just things. And I, I have more than that. I have, I have happiness. I know that sounds really quirky and cliche, but yeah, every day I know I've done something good. It really doesn't. And I think sometimes as we talked about living our purpose and living our lives, we take for granted how important happiness is every single day, how important it is. And honestly, giving back, if you're feeling yourself stuck and you haven't figured out what to do, get out of your house and go help somebody and you automatically find some purpose that you're like, oh my God, things will get better. I love the fact that you said, I'm going to leave my 401k and everything I work for <laughs> and take the, this is some serious questions. Let's be honest about it. You have to seriously believe, am I meant to do this? And you said it, you found your purpose and I love yeah. it. Because that's what we want our listeners, that's what we want our viewers to kind of find is, what is your purpose? What is that thing that motivates? What is your why? And you're that's not right. Making, you're not making millions, but you're making millions of smile. Think of all the people you have impacted throughout your career and all these different nonprofits. Yeah, it is. It is. And I'm so glad that you said that. I listened to the Ramsey, the Ramsey show. And one of the things that you have to do in making a transition from a job or, you know, just your career in general or stepping out and doing something that's not in your comfort zone is find the reason why. That has and become it, well, it pays off. It does. It has become kind of a little bit of a buzzword. I know Simon Sinek has said it and he has a whole book about it. He has a TED talk. It is all about why are we doing this as adults? We need a reason why. We're not just gonna jump out there and do things outside of a comfort zone just because it sounds good. It's like, how does it connect? I love the fact that you went back and said, you know, what is what it resonates? You know, I'm doing something for somebody else and it still feels good. You know, you don't have any resentment. You're like, I did gave up this life and now I'm I'm sitting here. You're still having a blast. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And people need to venture out. People need to be in the proximity of what they want to do and once they find that and, and they're in it then jump into it and just do it Ooh, i love that so we're getting <laughs> ready to come to almost the end and i want everybody who is watching us if they want more information about habitat for humanities here in texacana or as a whole where do they go where can they find information uh, well, you know, they can always call. The easiest thing is pick up the phone or just say, Siri, call the Habitat. And it's 903-832-1746. And so then they can go visit our restore. It's open Wednesday through Saturday from 9 to, 9 to 5. And it's at 3632 New Boston Road. You can't miss it. It's a half a mile from Walmart. So <laughs> just on the uh, east side of the highway, uh, I do want to say that you as a Rotarian um, can understand this, our incoming international president. And I'm going to paraphrase this because I can't ex remember exactly how the, the quote goes. But he said that our our time here 
is the space that we're taking is the rent that I'm paying for the reasons I'm here. Now I bust it up. Now, now I'm going to have to look it up and really find what, what it was. Do you remember what that I is? Actually, I actually think I do. He was talking about, he's been doing a lot of lectures around it for anybody who's not familiar with Rotary International. We're over yeah, four years yeah. old, another amazing nonprofit. He was Yes, he was talking about service. Yes. And it was service is the rent for the space I occupy on this earth. Exactly. And I want to be a good tenant of this earth. It is one of those things I think at times, especially in a world where we're so disconnected and we have to use different technology, sometimes we feel we're alone and sometimes we feel we're on our own little island, completely isolated. And we forget we're meant to be in communities and we're meant to be in communities helping each other. And there's a joy to it. There is something that comes back that we tend to get out of our heads. Let's be That's right. That's right. Yeah. We tend to get out of our spaces. We tend to forget our problems for that time. And we've realized, oh my God, I can do something better and bigger and for other people. So Rotary does an amazing job. Habitat for Humanities is changing lives. I learned about it when I was in the military in Kansas. I got invited to a build and I'm like, I don't know oh. what I'm doing. I know. They invited us like, you want me to put up a wall? Like, oh, seriously, you want me to put up a wall? Like, I was like, I might kill somebody. And there was 10 of us. And it was such a beautiful thing just to watch a bunch of soldiers come together in this small neighborhood you know, in Junction City, Kansas, to help a family that needed it. So for that and anybody's wow. looking for it, I know it's one of those things that to this day, it's been more than 15 years, I still remember and I'm still going, it changed the way I saw the world because it was a bunch of volunteers helping a family get a step up. It wasn't a hand-me-down, it was a step up. And that that's right, around. that's right. And now that you know that they paid for that house, it makes it even more special. <laughs> It does. It changes the perception because you know it's like you are a homeowner like everybody else. Be proud of that and own it. And know That's that right. you work you work for this harder than most people will ever work for a house. Let's be honest. That's I did right. not, I didn't put any walls in my house when I bought it. I was just like that didn't happen. That's right. And they're fulfilling their American dream of Which owning their own home. Yes. Yeah. Miss Mary, it has been a pleasure. I am so happy you join us to our viewers. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And as a Rotaria, now we know we do. We're just taking up space. But service is that, that reward. Absolutely. And we're paying it and service it and we're helping other people. So if for everybody's looking at it, there's nonprofits all over your community. If you're in Texarkana, we have plenty. So go ahead and look for one that actually touches your soul, that resonates with what you do. Follow Miss Mary's dream and continue to live that great path. I'm going to be back on Facebook. So if you have time, 1130, we're going to be doing literally a fun workshop. It's 1130 to 130. We're going to be talking about dare to believe. Dare to believe in yourself. So today was all about how do you help others? Can you help yourself get out of your rod? Can you help yourself dream bigger and believe that you're meant to live your dreams? And until next time, we're actually going to be back next week because it's we had a special week this month. So happy Memorial Day, Miss Mary. Thank you so much for joining Thank you. us. Thank have, you. Have an amazing day. And to all of our viewers, it's been a pleasure. Know that I'm dreaming, I'm praying, and I'm wishing you an amazing time. So bye, everybody.